Let me tell you a little story, friends. This story is from a carrier store manager at a major insurance company, and this manager has worked for this company since the early 90s. And if you're a new adjuster or even an experienced one, you're going to want to hear this story starting now. You're watching the Property IA Show. This video is sponsored by Kaplik. Are you an insurance adjuster? Then you need insurance adjuster. Learn all about E&O, general liability, and even commercial auto coverages in the free guide at cplic.net slash adjuster TV and by the IA firm CCMS and Associates. To apply to this fast growing and innovative firm, send an email to careers at ccmsclaims.com. Do not forget to attach your resume. Hey, it's Matt here with Adjuster TV and for the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, subscribe to Adjuster TV on YouTube right now. It's one of the biggest things you can do to help Adjuster TV. Okay, this is from a conversation I had with this carrier manager. They said, quote, I had a complaint today where the adjuster was asking for receipts or pictures of an ice chest worth $90, patio furniture worth $500, and a grill worth $430. Lost location was in the middle of the eye of the hurricane. I asked the adjuster if he could provide me the same if a tornado blew his stuff away right now. And he said, no. I said, put it on the contents inventory form, depreciate it and pay it. I know people take advantage of these situations, but the personal property claim was less than 1500 bucks. In other words, don't nitpick claims just do what makes sense. We as the insurance company spend more money arguing over a minor issue than it would take to pay the claim." End quote. Now in fairness to the adjuster, we do have some pretty specific and explicit directives from our firms and the carriers about how we are to handle every different possible scenario when we're out in the field running claims or even at the desk. But I think this is something that can be applied a bit more broadly. And what do I mean? When I first started doing claims, I was terrified that I was gonna screw up, spend too much of the carrier's money, and get in trouble if I didn't stick to the estimating guidelines word for word. And based on the questions I get in my email and that I see on social media, I think that's a pretty common fear. You just don't know, right? So even though this carrier manager is getting frustrated by this, do not be too hard on yourself. It takes experience to learn where the gray areas are and where you can bend the rules a little bit. You have to remember the overall point of the insurance of that relationship between the carrier and their customer, which is, of course, the insured, right? So what is that point? It's to transfer risk, not to adhere to some set of estimating guidelines or rules. That's not the goal. We have to make sure to make the insured whole within the constraints of the policy and the estimating guidelines. So that means to be reasonable and to be fair. Think about it this way. If you won't pay for $1,500 worth of yard contents that were blown away with the rest of the insured's house during a major hurricane, because they can't provide proof that they own those items, eventually what's gonna happen? The insured is going to complain, like they did in this case, and the manager said to pay it anyway. So they're gonna pay it anyway. Now the insured is mad. Now you can certainly argue that you did your job and that if the carrier wants to do something different from the estimated guidelines, that's on them. And I will say that in a lot of cases, that's the attitude that you need to have. But you kind of have to think beyond your part of the claims process. As somebody who's been a staff adjuster, I know that even the simplest claims can be in my queue for months. I'm gonna end up paying for the cooler and the grill and the furniture in the end anyway. Why? Well, for one reason, it's perfectly reasonable for those items to be in somebody's yard. In fact, it'd be kind of weird if they didn't since everybody does. Also, I've damaged goodwill with the insured now by denying this. By denying those small items, I've just reinforced a major piece of conventional wisdom about insurance companies, and that is that they will try to save money on claims by not paying for what they owe or by dragging out the process. If the insured feels like he has to fight just to get a cooler covered, he's not going to be easy to deal with, and there's a really good possibility that he will drop this carrier and go to somebody else. And I can tell you right now, this is the very last thing that any insurance company wants. If they lose a customer, but save 1400 bucks on a claim, that's not good business practice at all, okay? So the bottom line here is, is to not be scared to do what makes sense. But if you find yourself in a situation like this and you're conflicted between strictly applying the estimated guidelines and giving the insureds the benefit of the doubt that they had those items, 
call your IA manager and ask. That's what they're there for. State what you would like to do and ask if that's okay. Do not call your carrier manager. I don't care if they put their cell phone number on the whiteboard and insist that you call them. Never call them unless your IA manager tells you to, okay? Always call your IA manager first. Just trust me on this one. Remember, one of your big goals when you're working in the field is to keep your manager's phone from ringing. That doesn't mean ringing from you, calling him or her. That means them getting blindsided by angry insureds, contractors, agents, insurance commissioners. You get the idea. Your IA manager is gonna thank you. Why? Because her job is to keep the carrier's manager's phone from ringing with complaints about anything from anybody. If you can do all that, all your managers are gonna love you. Is it starting to make sense yet? Okay, here are four more ways to get some professional Definitely platonic, in no way inappropriate affection from your claims team management. Maintain good communication with the insured, even just to say that you're working on whatever it was you told them that you were working on in your next steps conversation. If you get a voicemail, you've got a little bit of reasonable grace here, meaning that people don't expect you to call back immediately, generally speaking. In my experience, you got about a four hour window before an insured will start to lose their cool and start calling managers. This is why when I'm building my schedule, I will block out time to sit down with my voicemail and make return phone calls, usually while I'm eating tacos. You certainly can answer the phone every time it rings, but I'm telling you, you will never get anything done if you do that. Your voicemail is like an automated answering service. Take advantage of it. But wait a second, you didn't explain next steps? Another way to cultivate goodwill with your managers is to always set expectations with the insured and to explain the process, especially the ACV, RCV conversation. Few things will generate more calls to anybody, you, your manager, or the agents, is the insured not knowing what's going on. This one really should be number one, to be honest. If the insured is confused about anything, they're gonna start calling whoever. This is also when the he said, she said stuff starts up. Well, the adjuster told me I was only gonna get half the money. How am I supposed to get the work done for that? Is that what you really said? Probably not. For me, as a field adjuster, the biggest thing I can do in this case is to close my files on site. The things that insureds usually call about aren't the totals or how many linear feet of baseboard you've got in your estimate, but what is depreciation? When are they gonna get a check? How do they pay the contractor? Who do they pay their deductible to? How do they get the second check? And most importantly, and a big one is, what to do if the contractor's estimates come back higher, okay? If you can answer all those questions while you're at the insured's house, while they're standing right in front of you, then you can watch their body language to see if they actually understand what you said or believe you. So what does that do for you? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. If I'm explaining all of this in person, I can watch a person's face and body language and it will tell me if they really understand me or not. No matter what they're saying, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. You can tell if they really get it by what they're doing with their body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. You can't see any of what I just did over the phone, right? So as soon as you get off the phone with them, they're going to be on the phone to their agent complaining that they aren't going to get all the money that they were supposed to get or whatever, right? So when you're standing there and you see them using body language that is the opposite of what they're saying, you can adapt your presentation. So in this case, having their arms crossed like this means that they're kind of like, it's a little bit of a defensive move, right? They're kind of self-comforting. And if they have their finger over their mouth like this, that means that they don't agree or they, they want to say something, but they're stopping themselves. And if they're saying yes, and their head's doing this, then you're good, that's a completely mixed signal. What they're really thinking is no, I don't get it. But they're saying yes because they don't want to look like a, they're not intelligent or for whatever reason, they don't understand. So it's your job to make them understand before you leave the house. So again, if you're in the middle of explaining depreciation and the person is saying yes, sure, I get it, but you can tell that they don't, then you can back up and start over with a super simple example like this. Okay, let me give you an example. So your roof is 12 years old, right? That shingle that you have on there has an average useful lifespan of about 25 years. At 12 years, it's used up about half of its lifespan, right? So it's about 50%. Your insurance company is going to pay you that 50% up front until you have the work done, until you have the roof replaced. 
Just send in a receipt from the roofer and we'll send you up to that remaining amount, that other 50%, and then you can pay off the contractor and then you're all done. And this last part is the big one that they really wanna know. The only thing that should be out of your pocket at any given time in this whole process is your $500 deductible and that goes to the contractor, right? If you say that one sentence to an insured, that's gonna knock down 80% of your phone calls. Okay, here's another one that you would think would be a no-brainer, but apparently isn't. Do not be rude to the customers that are paying your salary. You think that the carrier is paying your salary or the IA firm is paying your salary? No. The insured is through their premium. That's where the money comes from. And I personally will go a lot farther in my definition of who the customer is personally. The carrier is my customer, the agent is my customer, all the managers and all the other adjusters are my customer, and even that storm chaser, roofer, that guy or lady is my customer. I treat them all the very same at all times, and that is with dignity, respect, and friendliness. I'm never gonna take anything one of them says personally, because why? I've got a job to do, and if somebody is having a very bad day or a very bad life, that's just part of the job. I don't get to choose who I deal with as an adjuster. I have to make the choice to treat everybody that I come into contact with as if they are my number one customer. For some reason, people disagree with that, especially the contractor part, but for me, it's worked extremely well. I don't get into fights in front yards since I adopted that attitude early on in my career. And really the core of that attitude is one of service. I'm there to uphold the relationship between the carrier and their insured first and foremost, right? I'm not there for myself first. Obviously, it's a really good job, but the people that make the big bucks as claims pros all share this in common. They act like professionals no matter who they're dealing with or when they're dealing with them. And finally, when you know there's gonna be a big blow up, call the agent first and then call your manager and you make those two calls before the customer calls those people, okay? So they're usually gonna call their agent first because that person is who they probably already have a relationship with, and then they're gonna get your manager's number from the agent. So you've got a very small window in which to give everybody a heads up that an insured has had a come apart. Super simple, okay? Don't call anybody any names, you just state the facts. Hey, I'm Matt, I'm a field adjuster with your company handling claims in your area, and I just left an insured of yours's house. I was unable to find any storm damage to the roof, and he was not happy about it, and I wanted to give you a heads up that he might be calling. They will thank you 100% every time for the heads up, and that's really all you have to say. Even if it's on the weekend or after hours, leave a simple voicemail if you have to. After you leave the insurance house, drive right around the corner and call that agent immediately. I guarantee that the angry insured is doing the exact same thing. There's an old adage in our business, he who calls the agent first, wins. This is also one of the reasons that I strongly advocate for doing agent visits early on in a storm or daily claims deployment. Again, super easy. Take some business cards with you and visit the agents in the area where you're running claims. You don't have to make an appointment, just walk in and introduce yourself and give them a card with your direct contact info on it. I always say, hey I'm Matt, I'm running claims in your area for Acme Insurance Company through a third party called ABC claims. Here's my contact info. If you guys have any questions, feel free to give me a call. If one of your customers calls or comes in and needs to talk to me for any reason or you have any or he has any questions or says he hasn't been contacted yet and I'm his adjuster, then you just give him my cell phone number for sure. Do you guys have any questions or anything for me? Okay, great. Bye bye. That's it. You're done. Takes less than 10 minutes. Okay, that's it for me. For much more information about becoming a successful claims professional, including many more videos, free tutorials, the best gear and software for claims, and industry news and weather reports, head on over to adjustertv.com and hit that like button because remember, everybody is your customer. And as always, thank you so much for watching and have a great storm.